Good morning. I, uh, when either Tom or Brennan, I, I couldn't tell who said it, when they said Patrick Dennis would be speaking this morning, I heard one person clap, and I was glad about that because I didn't know my mom was here this morning. So <laughs> wherever you are, mom, thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here. Welcome to those of you that are online, by the way. We're thrilled that you are here with us this morning. Um, we are continuing our series in Proverbs, and we'll get to that just in just a moment. But first, I wanted to talk about this. For those of you that are observant, you saw this sitting on the table um, and were thinking, why does he have that up here? And I thought, well, if I get bored during my own sermon, I can just maybe do this. Actually, no, I don't remember how to solve this. I learned once. Um, But it's a Rubik's Cube. Just out of sheer curiosity, raise your hand if you've seen or heard of a Rubik's Cube before. Actually, I should say if you never have. Never mind. It doesn't matter. Um, They were... The Rubik's Cube was invented uh, in 1974, and those of you that are as old as I am or older will remember it as a kid, and it was an enormous fad. It got huge. It seemed like Rubik's Cubes were everywhere when they first appeared on the scene in the mid-70s. I was just a little boy. Um, But then, like fads do, it kind of went away. It just disappeared as fast as it showed up. You could still buy them at Toys R Us, I guess, until 2004, at which point cubing made quite the comeback. Um, And it did so because a guy in the Netherlands and the guy in the United States got together and decided to form the World Cubing Association. They thought if we could have events with delegates there that would certify times, we could kind of create it, make it a competition to see who could do it the fastest. Since the World Cubing Association was founded, More than 150,000 individuals have taken part in a competition. Most of those have taken part in many competitions. Before COVID happened, they were having 10 to 12 to 15 to 18 to 20 competitions per weekend around the world. I think the number, the total number of competitions that have been held since they started is uh, over 7,000. In fact, we had one here a couple of years ago at the end zone. We hosted one. Um, And amazing things have happened uh, in terms of people's ability to solve these things. Put your hands up if you think the world record for the fastest solve ever is less than a minute. Let me see your show of hands. That, okay. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up if you think that the world record is faster than 30 seconds. A lot of hands still up. Uh, if you think the world record is faster than 15 seconds, keep your hand up. If you think the world record is faster than 10 seconds, keep your hand up few hands. If you think the world record is faster than five seconds, keep your hand up. You all are correct. 3.47 seconds. How crazy is that? Um, Perhaps even more mind-boggling is an event they do at some of these competitions called the multi-blind. There's already a competition where you can look at the cube and then put on your blindfold and solve it. I think the world record for that is 15 seconds without seeing what they were doing. But there's a, there's a competition called the multi-blind where you bring as many cubes as you want to the judges and put them down, and they scramble them, official scrambles, um, and you get one hour to solve all of them. And you tell them how many you want to do. But the trick is you have to solve them blindfolded. Um, and in fact, the clock starts, and it's running as you investigate, as you look at the first cube, and then look at the second cube, and then look at the third cube, all the way to however many cubes you want. And then you put on your blindfold solve the first one, grab the second one, solve it, third one, solve it, without ever taking off your blindfold. And the world record for that in one hour is 59 cubes. If somebody just said, that's amazing, it is, that's crazy. That that level of intellectual capacity is something with which I am not familiar. That is way over my head. It is unbelievable that a human can do that, and yet a kid did. Um, So these competitions are fun to watch. The reason I brought this, though, that the thing that interests me about this is that there are 43.2 quintillion ways you can scramble a cube. 43.2 quintillion different ways this can be messed up. I I guess actually one would be not messed up. Um, And when I tried to solve this as a kid, I could get the first layer, I could get the second layer, And I could move pieces around on the third layer without messing up the first two layers, but I could never get them to go where I want. And finally, I just gave up. And really, there's four ways to solve the cube, right? You figure it out. You solve it. 
The second way would be to get someone to teach you and, and you solve it. The third way, which, is, which I also accomplished, was take the thing apart and then put it back together correctly, right? That works. Um, I've heard, I don't, this isn't one of my four, but I've heard some people have tried to take the stickers off the old one and move the stickers around. I can't imagine that working more than once. That's a disaster. But the, the last way was this, because this was before the days of the internet. This is a little booklet called The Simple Solution to Rubik's Cube. I have owned this. This might be one of the oldest things I own. I've owned this since like elementary school. And the whole booklet is 64 pages long. The reason that interests me is because there are 43.2 quintillion ways this can be messed up. So this book can't possibly begin to give you every possible scenario in which you could find yourself, right? There's no way. It's impossible. This book would be thick enough, I don't know, to go to the moon if it had that many solutions. What it does is it teaches you principles that you can apply, things that you can recognize and go, okay, when this situation comes up, I know what to do about it. And that's exactly what the Bible is like. That's exactly what Proverbs is like. I love Proverbs because I would recommend spending more time than just opening up and reading a verse or two in the Bible because you will gain wisdom. Um, but if you only have a moment and you want to go somewhere to get a quick bite of wisdom, Proverbs is phenomenal. I know people that read one proverb a day because you could pretty much read the whole book of Proverbs in one month when you do that. But you could literally open up to Proverbs and read one verse and you're probably more likely to get an immediate piece of wisdom in Proverbs if you only had one verse to read than pretty much anywhere else in the Bible. And when we start doing this series on Proverbs, it means this morning is going to be a little different. You know, for those of you that have been around a while, you know I, I'm up here from time to time when they can't find anybody else to speak. Um, and what I like to do typically is take a passage of Scripture and walk through that. But this morning, we're going to talk about a topic instead. It's not something we typically do, but the topic we're going to talk about is our work life. Because even though some of us may say that's not the most important thing about us, maybe many of us would say that, it is the thing that takes most of our waking hours during the week. And, and, and what we're going to talk about this morning applies to you if you are working and have a job, uh, if you work for somebody, if people work for you, or if you are a stay-at-home and mom, mom or dad, or if you are a student. Anyone that's involved in productive activity, I think, will find wisdom this morning, wisdom for work from the book of Proverbs. So let me, let me pray for us. Lord, thank you that you have given us your word, that you speak through it, and you speak into every area of our life. So, Father, in this area that can cause stress, that can be difficult, that can be frustrating, we invite you in to speak into our lives this morning, to speak into our professional life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The last couple of weeks, we've started this series on Proverbs, and Brett mentioned a passage that actually, I think if you had to have a short list of passages you might want to memorize for your own spiritual growth, these two would be ones you would want to strongly consider. Brett mentioned them, but intentionally I'm going to mention them again. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, know him. A different translation says acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. As we start thinking about this idea of our, of our work and of our work life, we sometimes tend to create this false division between our spiritual life, what we do on Sunday mornings or when we think about God, and our professional life. And yet, what we'll see this morning, and what you see as you study Scripture, that that's a false dichotomy, that everything that God wants to speak in every area of our life, and when, when there are Proverbs that are applied to our life, they apply to our work life as well, because everything is spiritual. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, uh, in all of your ways acknowledge Him, in everything that we do. So we spend the majority of our week, and what do we call it? How do we think about work? Most often we think about it as like, got to get back to the grind, right? Everybody hates Monday mornings. Everybody loves Friday afternoons. Why? Because we get to stop working and have the weekend off, unless you work on weekends as well. We tend to think of work as not a great thing, and yet, and yet 
God wants to speak into that, and I, and, and I believe his word will do that this morning. We are, uh, God, is, uh, God cares about our work. So as we start to look into this, um, I want to say first, if you are here and you are not a Christian, you are still investigating what you believe about, about Christianity, about God. Maybe you're not sure God exists at all, or you're sure that God probably exists, but you're not sure that Jesus was actually God or that Jesus was who he claimed to be. Let me say first and before everything else, we're thrilled that you're watching online. We're thrilled that you're here. Because the question, is Jesus who he claimed to be, is probably one of the most important questions ever. The Bible itself in 1 Corinthians 15 says, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then all of this is worthless. This is all a fraud. It's all based on an event in history. So what you need to know, if you're here this morning and still wrestling with all this, is that the God of the universe who created you loves you immensely and wants to have a relationship with you, invites you to become his child, invites you into a personal relationship, not only for here on earth, but for all of eternity in heaven. But but the relationship that God has created us to have with him has been broken, and it's been broken by our own sin. A sin is whatever we do, think, or attitudes that don't honor or glorify God. And we all sin, every one of us, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the problem is that Uh, Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin, what we deserve for our sin, is death, a spiritual separation from God. See, people that generally believe in God, but not specifically Christianity, tend to think something like this quite often, at least in our culture. They think if there is a God and our goods outweigh our bads, then we get a green light into heaven, right? But if our bads outweigh our goods, we get a red light. And if they or kind of equal, well, I guess that's a yellow light that God has to sort out. But that's not what biblical Christianity teaches. What it teaches is that no matter how good you are compared to everyone else, think of the best person you can imagine if it's not you. No matter how good you are, our sin has created a red light. And that's awful news. But that's why God stepped into the time, time-space continuum in the, in the form of Jesus. That's why God showed up. And Jesus willingly went to the cross. Why? So that God could pour out his wrath, his anger at our sin onto Jesus. Why does God have wrath or anger towards sin? First of all, because he's holy. And so he can't have sin in his presence. But second of all, because sin destroys. It is what kills us. It's what is destroying his creation. It's what's destroying us. Whether we feel it or not, whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, sin is killing us. And God hates anything that would kill his creation. So Jesus went to the cross to be punished, to accept the punishment we deserve, I deserve for my sin, so that if he took my punishment then I could be forgiven and made right with God. If that's not a reality in your life and you're curious and you want to know more, come find me after the service. Talk to Tess or Brennan. They'll be back at the take, take five thing. Talk to Tom if he's here. Whoever's around, maybe someone that brought you or someone that's on staff here, ask them what that means because getting right with God is mission number one if we want to be the people that God has made us to be. For the rest of us, for those people that have come into a relationship with Christ and and have trusted Christ's forgiveness on the death for the forgiveness forgiveness of our sins, God has promised that he's going to work in our lives to make us the men and women he wants us to be. And that's not just for Sunday mornings. That's for Monday through Friday as well and Saturdays and any other time. So when we look into Proverbs this morning, it's going to inform three things. It's going to inform our view of work, how we see it. It's going to inform how we should work. And when I say work, again, if you're a student, this applies to you. This applies to you because any productive activity, it applies to. It's going to shape our view of work, how we work, and our future decisions about work. Those are three things we're going to look at this morning. First, our view of work. Why is it that we work? Well, first of all, we work to bring honor to God. You may not remember this or may not know this unless you've read the first couple of chapters of Genesis, but if you have, you understand that God created us to work. He created us in his image. He was a worker, so it makes sense that we would be workers. And here's the interesting part. He created work for Adam before the sin, before sin entered the world, before the fall of man. 
When the fall happened, when sin, sin entered the world, work became cursed. It became frustrating. It became the grind. It became the thing that we don't look forward to on Monday mornings. But before the fall, Adam still had stuff to do. He had ways that he was to be productive. And that's the way we're made. My dad sold his company and was only retired for about six months until he realized, I am dreadfully bored. I need something to do. And maybe those of you that are retired here can relate to that because we were made to be productive. I believe in heaven we will have things to do that fulfill us and satisfy us. I don't believe we're going to sit around playing the harp all day with our feet up on a lounge chair somewhere. I, I don't know exactly what heaven's going to be like, but here's, here, here's the thing. Um, I've done a lot of different things in my career, both ministry and professionally, and professionally I've done a lot of work in the area of graphic design, branding, brand strategy, that sort of thing. But one thing I love to do and will do until the day I die if people will hire me to do it is to create logos. I love it. It's, it's, I've, done, I've done, it, done it for 30 years and absolutely love the challenge of encapsulating a company or organization in a one inch by one inch square. That's fun for me. I would actually do it. If I didn't need to make a living, I would do it for free. That's how much I enjoy it. I don't know if there will be logos in heaven. <laughs> um, I actually tend to think there probably won't be. I can't quite imagine why there would, be a need, why there would need to be a logo in heaven. But whatever it is in me, that finds satisfaction in that, whatever it is in me that finds fulfillment in, creating, in using my creativity in that way, I believe will be applied somehow in heaven, that we will have work to do there. But on, heaven, uh, but on earth, because of the fall, work is not always a joy, is it? It's, it can be stressful, it can be frustrating, if I had to ask you how many people woke up in the morning and can't wait to get to your job on Monday morning, I bet the number of hands would be fewer than if I said, how many of you hate your job? Probably the same would be true if I asked about your boss. And yet, in the midst of that, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, in all of your ways, in all of your ways know him, and he will make your path straight. See, it's about an upper story versus a lower story. We talk about all the time. Lower story is what we're experiencing down here. You know, what, I, what happens to me when I sit down at my desk on Monday morning? What happens to you when you walk into your office or walk into wherever it is you go to work on Monday morning? Whatever's happening right then is lower story, but there's also an upper story in which God is working in ways that we may or may not be able to see. Sometimes he lets us see it. Um, Colossians 3.17 says something very much like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. When we apply that to work, whatever we do, we're supposed to do as if we have an audience of one. That, that whatever we do, we're supposed to do in the name of the, the Lord Jesus, and we're supposed to give thanks in the process. But for some of us, the thought of giving thanks for our work situation we find ourselves in right now doesn't compute. It's really difficult for some of us. So what does it look like? What's the end of Proverbs, um, or the beginning of Proverbs 3, 5 say? Do not rely on your own understanding. See, we've got to understand there's an upper story in play. When I was first out of college, I think I told this story five or six years ago when I spoke here. For, so, so for the two of you that remember it, bear with me here. But when I first got out of college, I worked at a place that I would have never imagined in a million years I would have worked. I worked in the headquarters of Wild and Woolly Needlecrafts. <laughs> and I used to think, how many hundreds of thousands of jobs could I name that I thought I would do before I would do work at a place called Wild and Woolly Needlecrafts selling counted cross-stitch, whatever. I, yeah, I was involved in communication stuff. I worked with the president, so that was pretty cool. But for more than a year, as I worked there, I was like, Lord, what in the world am I doing here? And there were some reasons I took the job. I don't need to get into that right now. I think it turned out pretty cool. But that was the lower story perspective. The upper story says God is always at work in ways you can't see. What I could not see was that a friend of mine moved to Northern Virginia to live with the family, Spencer and Barbara Brand, and that friend suggested that Spencer interview me to be his communications director for a nonprofit he was starting. I, because of the experience I had at Wild and Willie Needlecraft, because of some stuff I learned and was able to do with regard to uh, creative work, 
Spencer hired me. But I never would have gotten a job at the endowment if I hadn't had the year at Wild and Woolly learning stuff and working on the stuff that I worked on in, 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 the, in the creative realm. And what happened at the endowment is that God brought Spencer Brand into my life, one of my lifelong mentors, really. I have not made many life decisions without going to talk to Spencer about it first. But not only did he bring Spencer into my life, Spencer introduced me to a pastor, and I started going to that church, my wife and I did, um, and met some incredible families, the church we came to before we came to New Life. For a long time, we were there. And when we decided to go into full-time staff with college students, we had to raise financial support to make it possible. And most of the support came from those families we met that I would have not met if I hadn't met Spencer. On top of that, the creative stuff I did at the endowment led to my being able to start a design company in 1999 that I owned for 10 years. Why do I share all that? Because those things could not have happened if I had not been at Wild and Woolly before that and learned it exactly what I'd learned so that I could interview and get that next job at the endowment. It did not make sense from a lower story perspective, but looking backwards, I can see what God was doing. And that's the way God so often works. It doesn't seem to make sense in the moment. But then looking backwards, you go, oh, I get it. I get it. And, and, and when we try to live God's way with the right attitude and we, and we give thanks and we, and we uh, in all of our ways we acknowledge him and whatever we do in word or deed we do in the name of the Lord Jesus, when we have a big picture, eternal perspective and mindset, then there are rewards. There are things that come from that. Listen to Proverbs 2, 1 through 10. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, listening closely to wisdom and directing your heart to understanding, furthermore, if you call out to insight and lift your voice to understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it like a hidden treasure, then listen to some of these the things that come from living God's way. You will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up success for the upright. For the, uh, he is a shield for those who live with integrity so that he may guard the paths of justice and protect the way of his faithful followers. Then you will understand righteousness, justice, love, and integrity, every good path, for wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will delight you. We work to bring honor to God. The second thing about our view of work is we work to provide for our physical needs and the physical needs of others. Um, about our physical needs. This one's kind of obvious. Proverbs 12, 11, the one who works his land will have plenty of food, but whoever chases fantasies, or another translation says, for who, but whoever chases worthless things lacks sense. Proverbs 16, 26, a worker's appetite works for him because his hunger urges him, him on. This was true in an agrarian society, and it's true today. It's a biblical principle that we work. It's God's method for providing for us. We work so that we can eat. It's explicit. Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, if anyone will not work, neither, neither shall he eat. Um, but it's not just about our own needs. God blesses us so that we can meet the needs of others as well. We're to be good stewards. Proverbs 21, 26, He is filled with craving all day long, but the righteous give and don't hold back. The righteous give and don't hold back. I love that. Why? We were created in God's image. And for God so loved the world that what did He do? Gave gave his only son. If God is a giver, then we are going to be fulfilled when we are acting like he does. When we are giving, we are going to be fulfilled. And there are a lot of Proverbs like this next one I'm going to read, 22.9, the generous will themselves be blessed for they share their food with the poor. Now, there's been a lot of discussion in our political arena, and I'm not getting into that, don't get nervous, about socialism and some of the benefits of different iterations of socialism. You know what? It might work if we weren't selfish people. It might work if there weren't lazy people. Um, there are ideas the, from the rich give to the poor, whatever. But I'd like to suggest this when it comes to politics and when it comes to this particular topic, especially poverty. If the church, the universal church, including New Life and all other Christian churches, were doing and being what we were supposed to do and be, the 
poverty problem would be much smaller than it is. There are tremendous numbers of passages about being generous to the poor here. God does not bless us so that we can buy the second or third house. He does not bless, I mean, not that it's wrong to own a second or third house. If your money is, if you're, if you're ha- having, giving everything to God first and giving away billions of dollars, sure, buy your second or third house, whatever. I'm not, not saying that's bad. What I am saying is that that can't be our focus just more and more and more for me. Jesus warns specifically about that when he talks about the guy that said, I'm just going to fill my barns, right? And, and then I'll live, eat, eat, drink, and be happy. And Jesus said, you fool, what if your life is required of you today? The point is, God, we work so that we can provide for our family, but also so that we can meet the needs of others. Third, we work to make a difference. We, it, it, we need to have a kingdom attitude. If you are a Christian, if you have accepted Christ in your life, accepted his forgiveness, then I want to challenge you this morning to become a missionary, period. Every one of you to become a missionary. Now, what I'm not saying is that every one of you need to go into full-time missionary work and quit your job and move somewhere. No, that's not my point at all. My point is that we desperately need doctors, teachers, accountants, tradesmen, craftsmen, artisans, um, laborers. We need men and women in those fields who see themselves not as a tradesman who happens to be a Christian, not as an accountant who happens to be a Christian, but who see themselves as a missionary that happens to be an accountant a missionary that happens to be a teacher, a missionary that happens to be a doctor. Because when we do that, we will start to see the gospel accelerate like we've never seen before. Um, I just looked this up between services. Chick-fil-A, which I love, and like you, I'm sad that we can't get after church, but it's probably good for their employees. I appreciate that they do that. Their mission is to be America's best quick service restaurant at winning and keeping customers. Do you know what their vision is? Their vision is to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us and to have a positive influence on all who come in contact with Chick-fil-A. That's amazing. Their corporate vision statement is to glorify God. I love that. And that's what it looks like when a company has a missionary mindset, when a company has the vision and a kingdom attitude. It's the stone cutter. You know, you ask one stone cutter back in the olden days, what are you doing? He goes, I'm slaving away cutting stone. And you ask another one what he's doing. He goes, I'm trying to be the best stone cutter I can be. And you ask the third one, what are you doing? And he says, I'm trying to build a cathedral. I'm part of building a cathedral. He gets it. And men and women, if we want to be the people that God wants us to be at work, we've got to have a kingdom mindset that says, I'm not just called to make disciples on Sunday mornings or in Bible study. I'm called to make disciples wherever I go. I'm called to be God's ambassador. I'm called to walk into the workplace and ask God to make a difference through me. If you are an accountant, you should be praying for your clients. You should be praying for your colleagues every day because the people that God has put you around in your workplace are not an accident. And that applies to whatever profession you're involved in, whatever activity. If you're a student, the people that are in your classes are not an accident. If you're a student, the people that live around you, if you're in college, are not an accident. The people that are on your sports teams are not an accident. So Proverbs informs our view of work, but the second thing, and we'll go through this one slightly more quickly, it informs how we work. There are at least three areas here where I think Proverbs is particularly challenging when it comes to our work life. The first, when we talk about how we work, we're to work with integrity. Proverbs 16.11 says, honest balances and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are His work. One commentator on this passage said, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but an accurate weight is His delight. What we're talking about here is being honest with people, not trying to take advantage of people. I heard somebody once say years ago, a good business deal makes both sides happy. But too often in business, people want to win the business deal, right? And, and, and when we think about this idea of dealing with people with integrity, we see it 
that God cares very much about this in Proverbs. Um, Proverbs 11.1 1 says, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but an accurate weight is His delight. Proverbs 20.17 says, Bread gained by deceit is sweet, but afterwards the mouth will be full of gravel. Let me ask you a real practical question. Is there a way in your job or in your school or in whatever you're involved in right now that you personally might be tempted to take a shortcut with regards to your integrity? And I have to ask myself the same questions. I don't claim by being up here that I got it all together. When I prepare these sermons, I'm preaching to myself as well as to you all. But what is the area where you might be tempted to fudge a little? Maybe when it comes time to communion, that would be a good thing to pray about. We're to work with integrity. The second way to work, according to Proverbs, is with diligence. I think we as Christians should set the example of what it means to be a hard worker, not just doing what the boss expects because we serve an audience of one. Yeah, we got a boss that expects certain things out of us, but going above and beyond is about trying to show the world, that we take our job seriously. Why? Because God calls us to the highest standard possible. It doesn't necessarily mean workaholism. It doesn't mean workaholism. We need balance. But listen to Proverbs 6, uh, 6 through 12. Go, look at, or go to the ant, you slacker. Observe its ways and become wise. The writer of Proverbs is telling us we can learn from the ant. Without a leader, administration, or ruler, it prepares its provisions in the summer. It gathers its food during harvest. How long will you stay in bed, you slacker? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the arms to rest, and your poverty will come like a robber, your need like a bandit. I don't personally struggle with the little sleep, little slumber, but I'll tell you what I, would, what, I, what I do struggle with some mornings. I will get up, and I will lie there in bed, and I'll be wide awake, and I'll turn on my phone and read Twitter, sometimes for an hour. That's not good. God is challenging me about that. I mean, is it, uh, you know, is it bad to read Twitter? No. I mean, is even an hour bad? I don't know. I, that's, but, but for me, I think it probably is. And so I'm, I'm challenged by this. And, and God calls us to diligence. Proverbs 13, 4, the slacker craves yet has nothing, but the diligent is fully satisfied. We're to work with integrity. We're to work with diligence. And the, second, uh, the third way to work, we're to work with others' needs in mind. This relates to how we treat people, how we treat our clients or our, the people that we work with, our colleagues, how we treat our customers, um, how we, especially the people you work with every day. I'm always fascinated by the fact that the number one, people, number one reason people leave the mission field is because of who they work with. How much weirder is that, or more true, does that have to be in the, in the business world or wherever it is you work? Um, Proverbs 25.11 speaks directly to this. A word, spoken, a word spoken at the right time is like golden apples on a silver tray. You know what difference you can make just by saying the right or kind or gracious thing in every circumstance. Will we get that right all the time? No, we won't. But... How we react to others matter. And what does that look like? Philippians 2, 3, Paul wrote, wrote, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. I got a great story about this, about a workplace guy that exemplifies this. Or exemp- I mean, the story was written a couple of years ago, and I want you to hear it, and it's going to take a minute or so to read, but it's really good. And it's about a professional football player. Um, <clears throat> for those of you that are college football fans, he was tremendous in college, um, Marcus Mariota. Then he went to the Tennessee Titans. He started for a couple of years there and now is uh, currently a backup with the Raiders. And regardless of what you think about Marcus as a football player, he's quite a man. Um, a story was written about him in The Ringer, and I've sent this to a ton of athletes, especially high school athletes that I know well, whose lives I've been involved with. Um, But I've sent this article to them, and I just want to read you parts of this. Why? Not so you're thinking, oh, that's cool, a professional football player is doing that. I don't want you to think that at all. I want you to listen to this and say, how can you apply this in your workplace? How can you apply some of the things, some of the ways that Marcus has let God's Word lead him to treat other people? I'll start, the article started like this. The first rule of Marcus Mariota is that he does not talk about himself. Already, that's refreshing, right? 
Uh, he can do many things. Roll out, throw across his body, hang in the pocket, uh, get the ball downfield, run past linebackers when he must, but self-praise is not one of them. It's a good thing, then, that everyone has a Mariota story. Last year, said, uh, said Titans center um, Ben Jones, this, this article was written back when he played for the Titans, last year there was a rookie who didn't have a car during preseason and training camp. Uh, Marcus found out, and he would drive the rookie back and forth. Even after we got home late uh, from preseason games, he would go 30 minutes each way out of his way. Who was it? Uh, ben Jones was asked. Jones said he wasn't a guy that even made the team. So here's the quarterback of the team driving a guy back and forth. These are the legends of Mark and Mar Marcus Mariota. He won't tell these stories, but everyone else will, like the time he drove three hours to help fix a teammate's car that had broken and then would not accept money for the things that he had bought. Here's how he's amazing, ta Titans tackle Taylor Luan said. He goes out with the boys even though he doesn't drink. Most people that would do that would go out with you, but they're going to be judgmental. They're going to look at you and say, oh, really? How many beers is that, Taylor? Marcus is not that guy, and he's always ready to be the designated driver. During training camps this summer, the writer of the article writes, uh, if I knew someone on any team who had interacted with Mariota, either with the Titans or when he was at Oregon, I asked, I asked what's your Marcus Mariota story? They always had one. Sam Cassell talks about a time in uh, uh, August when they were having a team meeting, and after the team meeting, they had a day off. And a day off in training camp to a football player is a really big deal. And, they, and what would typically happen is the meeting would end, and everybody would get out of Dodge as fast as they could. And Sam Cassell, the backup quarterback, uh, said, everyone's in a rush to get out, but there's these folding chairs in the meeting room that weren't put away, and one custodial guy was going to have to put them away, but Mariota walks back to the, meeting, the back of the meeting room and starts folding them up and, and helping the guy put them away. No other player is helping. I'm ready to get out of there, and I see Marcus doing it, and I think, oh, okay, I'll help too. And then other players jumped in, and it was done in just a moment. His high school coach told the story of they had a thing where the youngest quarterback on the roster would have to pick up all the cones and a lot of the footballs after practice until Marcus Mariota got there because when he got to his junior and senior year, he insisted he be the guy that picked up the cones and the footballs. This was after he had already gotten D1 offers and ended up going to Oregon. We've got a star that's already committed, and he's bringing in all the footballs he can. He goes, the article goes on to talk about how Mariota was always the one to take the blame when something went wrong on the field, how he could throw to a receiver, the receiver could bobble the ball, the ball could get intercepted, and he comes off the field and says it was his fault. Everybody on the sidelines knew it wasn't his fault, but he wanted the guys to know that he had their back. So many principles here about how Marcus would treat other people how Marcus would show integrity. They said he had the best work, work ethic on every team he's ever been on. If you ask people, he worked with diligence. He worked with integrity. He kept other people's in mind. He applied the stuff we're talking about right here in his workplace. And you tell me if you think he would have had a platform to talk to people about the gospel when the conversation came up. Amazing. So what does this look like for us? Uh, Got to go through this very quickly. But the third piece here, if Proverbs informs our view of work. It informs how we work. It also informs our fu future decisions about work. To have a kingdom mindset about work, to think well about it, we need to settle at least three things. Number one, where will your ultimate reward be found? Where will your ultimate re reward be found? Is it in your bank account, your 401k, your retirement property, whatever, or is it in heaven? Second, we've got to settle who's in charge of your career path. Is it you? Or are you seeking God to see where he wants you to be and trusting him when things don't quite make sense at the moment? Three, third thing we have to settle, why will you make the career decisions you make? Is it just about advancement? Is it about the lower story stuff? Or are you seeking God, seeking the upper story stuff? Now, very practical application, and we'll close. If Proverbs affects or informs our view of work and how we work and our future decisions about work. Let me just ask you point blank here for you to wrestle with this before we go into a time of communion. We're going to do communion in just a second. And during communion, I want you to ask the question, five things. Are there ways that God would have you change the patterns you're in right now when it comes to integrity Diligence, others', others needs, 
your attitude at work, especially if you're in a rough spot at the moment, and your trust in the Lord about your work. Maybe only one of these applies to you. Maybe none do. Maybe five do. But are there patterns God would have you change in the area of your integrity, your diligence, others' needs, your attitude, or your trust in God? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come together and take a look at your word and that your word speaks to every part of our life, not just Sunday mornings. Thank you that you want to speak into, that Proverbs speaks into our work life, that you give us wisdom, that you give us principles to apply. Help us, Father, be men and women of integrity. Help us work with diligence. Help us serve the needs of others. Lord, help us have a kingdom upper story mindset when we walk into work. Help us be missionaries, Father, that remember where our reward is. It's not on earth. It's in heaven. And Lord, forgive us for the times that we have fallen short of these ideals. We know that every one of us falls short. And God, we are so thankful to you, Jesus. We are so thankful to you that you came to earth to forgive us, those of us that have put our trust in you, that you have removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. Thank you for that, Jesus, because we need it, because we fail. And so we come before you as a family, as a congregation, as a people right now that want to be people that bring your light into the workplace, that want to be people who make a difference. And we do confess that we fail. So thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness, for dying on the cross for us so that we could be right with you despite our own sin. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.